Hey, so you got to have a little mercy on me. I'm not the most technologically literate. But, you know, I've learned a lot. I have some good friends. Now, can I raise this bad boy up? Yes, I can. Um, let me pull my Bible here. Okay, online, how many of you have a dog? What kind of dog do you have? Okay, that's just a little, little teaser there. Just type it in. I got a golden retriever or whatever. Are we getting any dogs here? Give me some love here. What's, give me some dog names. Give me some dog types. 15 second delay. Well, we're not going to delay real long because we have the Word of God that is living and active. Coming our way. Black Lab. Black Lab. Ooh. Boomer? Boomer the Black Lab. Hey, Boomer. Shout out to you. Anybody else? You want your dog on, on, uh, online and, and available to connect with people? Okay. I will, um, uh, I'm really excited about sharing God's Word with you today. I'm grateful to be here, and uh, this is a, a powerful, dense uh, passage of Scripture. We're going to be looking at Philippians 3, uh, but we're going to make reference to the, the, to the whole book and, you know, sometimes church can do Bible light. I'm so glad that Uptown is just so committed to the Word of God and uh, putting in the um, all and what Paul says about that. So he talks about running to win a race, uh, and, and we're going to talk about what that means. Because we all have a race to run, and we all have a race to be won, according to Scripture. But I want to start off with a story, and uh, if you're a dog lover, just you might want to close your eyes. I'm not going to show, show any pictures, but several years ago, uh, there was an article in the uh, Tacoma, Wash uh, Tacoma, Washington newspaper about a dog named Tattoo, and Tattoo did not intend on going for a run that evening, but when his owner accidentally trapped the dog's leash in the car door, Tattoo had no option. The car started taking off through the subdivision, and Tattoo uh, was trying to keep up with, with the owner. The owner was unaware, and the car continued to accelerate. The car got up to 25 miles an hour, and thankfully a police officer spotted the dog and the car, um, but not before Tattoo had reached full capacity and then rolled over a couple of times. Miraculously, Tattoo was not hurt, but this is what the officer said. The poor little dog was picking up his feet and putting them down as fast as he could. <laughs> I'm so glad Tattoo is okay. But that's a metaphor for many people's lives, isn't it? Pastor and author John Orberg wrote this, Too many of us end up living like Tattoo, our days marked by picking them up and putting them down as fast as we can. So here's a question. Do you ever feel like tattoo? I think in our culture, in our country, it's hard not to. Think about what was going through that poor little dog's mind. I'm stuck and I can't break free. Do you ever feel stuck? Life feels out of control. I think the pandemic, everybody's going to say, my life has felt out of control. I need to, be, I need to run my, or I'll be run over. And so we all have, feel like we have no excuse or no alternative. I don't feel like I have a choice except to live the way I'm living. And uh, surviving, not thriving, is my only goal. Let's be honest. Without intervention, Tattoo was signed up for a race. He was destined to lose. And uh, that is very difficult, and I meet people all the time who feel trapped in that cycle of uh, being out of control, and they feel like they're losing all the time. But here's the good news, and there's good news. God created us for a race we were created to win. And if we're followers of Christ and we're pursuing Christ, that we're destined to win. God promises we will win if we pursue the things that God has for us. And it's not a race that's based on strength or size or speed or IQ. It's based on saying yes to Jesus every day. And you may say, well, why does that matter? 
Um, because this, if you study the book of Philippians, uh, you're going to see that there's five benefits that Paul points out for people who pursue the race. And, and there's kind of twin themes. People will go one way or the other in the book of Philippians. I wish we had time to go into it, but I'll just tell you the twin themes. One is Christ-likeness. The, the book of Philippians all about what does it mean for us to become like Christ. And I'll just tell you the other theme is joy. And, and those two things go together, that when we're running the race of Christ-likeness, God, we experience a joy that this world can't produce, that God wants us to have. So here's five of the benefits that Paul will outline about those who run the race. They experience purpose. Does your life feel meaningless? A lot of us feel like, what's, my, what's the purpose of my life? We're promised purpose as we pursue Christ. Uh, we're promised joy, which I just mentioned. We're promised friendship. There's this word koinonia. It's lost, but there's this deep Christian word of deep connection and intimacy with other, other followers of Christ. We um, receive the gift of life. Jesus said, I have come uh, that you might have life and have it overflowing. And then intimacy with God. And aren't those the things we want? Those are the things you and I were created for. And this is what the world needs, doesn't it? Imagine what this world would look like if everybody who said they were a follower of Christ um, lived and behaved like Jesus over the last two years. Like full on. Like if people woke up, imagine our world, if everybody woke up every morning and said, Lord, help me to be like Jesus today. Holy Spirit, empower me to be like Jesus. And just like Jesus, help me to do good instead of harm. Because there's been a lot of harm done, Right? Or help me to pray instead of criticize people. Or help me to forgive rather than get bitter and cut people off. Or help me to bless, I learned a new word, blast. Have you heard this term, blast? Put you on blast. So it means, you know, I can just say whatever I think or want about you. And I'm, it's just all about the truth. I'm being real. And Scripture tells us we're supposed to bless people, not blast people. Or to invite people rather than isolate or call rather than wait to be called, or to love rather than hate, or to listen more than we speak. What would happen if we were serving rather than demanding to be served, and we were respecting rather than demanding respect? How would our world be different? It'd be, imagine what the last two years would look like if that were the, the marching orders of every person. Those are all little images of what it means to live and behave like Christ. So becoming like Jesus is God's plan for us, and um, it's God's plan to bless the world, because as we become like Christ, you and I, we become a blessing. We're blessed to be a blessing, and we bless the world. And Paul says this. Paul says it's like a race. So if you read Philippians 3, Paul's going to end in Philippians 3, uh, 10 and 11, with saying, I want to know Christ. And we're like, yes, I do too. And the power of his resurrection, amen, Lord, preach it. And the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. Oh, no, I don't want that. Becoming like him. And he's going to repeat that phrase. He's going to talk about becoming like Christ and actually ends the chapter in Philippians 3 with the same idea that we're going to be transformed by the resurrection power of Jesus. And we're, our, we'll be like him. Our bodies will be like him. Our lives will be like his. So Paul says it's just like running a race. And this passage is all about how to win the race. And so we're going to look at a few things uh, this morning to talk about that. But first we're going to read. Not that I have already obtained all this. So Paul's saying, I, 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 I want to be like Christ. I want to know Christ. I want to I be completely transformed. But he's saying, not that I've already obtained this, all this, or have already arrived at my goal. You're going to see that because that's the finish line, this idea of the goal. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, that's a really important phrase in Scripture, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Again, I, that word, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And listen to this next line. And if on some point you think differently, has this year been filled with people, points of where people think differently? But mature people, 
if, I, if you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us, what are those next two words? Live up rather than sink down. Let us live up to what we have already attained, this commitment to Christ, the family of God, the salvation that comes by faith, the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let us live up to these things and join together in following my example. Now, this is a really dense passage, um, and there's a lot here, but one of Paul's favorite metaphors, uh, Paul was a sports fan, okay? So he must have been at the Isthmian Games and other games that were the precursor to our modern-day Olympics. And so he talks about wrestling, and I grew up wrestling, so he would say, I wrestle not with flesh and blood. He talked about boxing. He said, I don't beat the air aimlessly, but I focus my blows. But by far, his favorite metaphor is the race. He, he, was, uh, he loved the races, and he ta- uses the metaphor of the race regularly. Uh, and he's going to say regularly, run in such a way as to win the prize in your Christian life. And so he pictured the believer as an athlete who is running the race. And in this passage, he gives five essentials. We're not going to go into all of them. But he gives five essentials of what it, how we win the race toward Christ-likeness. And we're going to look at those because he gives us those as he talks about all the beauty and benefits of being like Christ. He goes, but you were made to win this race, and this is how you win it. And so the first thing he says is this, never quit training. Never quit training. He said, not that I have already obtained all this or have already circled that word if you're opening your Bible. And if you don't have your Bible open at home, I just want to encourage you, look it up in your own scriptures. Read this. It's, it's so powerful. Not that I have already arrived at my goal. This first principle may surprise you, and the principle is this. If you are alive, (laughs) then you haven't arrived, okay? Tell that to the person next to you. Tell them online. If you are alive, you haven't arrived. And you say, well, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, What happens is it's easy to get complacent. It's easy to think, oh, I'm doing pretty good in my Christian life. And here's the, the, the example of Paul. Paul says, if anybody had reason to brag, Paul didn't. If you read the beginning of Philippians 3, Paul's t- Paul has a resume that's unbeatable. And he's experienced powerful, spirit-filled ministry. He's been part of performing miracles. This guy has just seen uh, every possible kind of fruit in ministry that you could have. And, but Paul said, I'm not, I'm not there yet. I haven't arrived. And he has a holy discontent that every believer needs to have. Because if we think we've arrived, then we're going to stop training. We're going to stop pressing. You notice that there's a lot of exertion words in here. Pressing, um, straining toward what is ahead, moving forward. And Paul says, that's the beginning of the end. If you think uh, you're there, you're, gonna, you're just going to get complacent and you're not going to make any spiritual progress. So spiritual progress requires spiritual training. Have you quit training? You say, what do you mean by training? Are you committed to church engagement? Now, you're online. I'm so glad you're here. Maybe uh, you were checked out for a period of time. Maybe you've been here the whole time. But a lot of people, let me tell you this statistic, uh, over a third of people who previously attended church before COVID are MIA. Think about that. One third of the churches, (laughs) not in person, not online, not anywhere. Pastors calling people, not getting ghosted. Think about that. One-third gone. Um, so committed church engagement. Are you committed to Uptown and being here? Are you in a small group Bible study? Are you training in God's Word and, and, and digging deep into what God has for you? Because God has something for you today. Even as we look in the Word, the Spirit has something for you and I today. The, I, food for the journey. Encouragement. Inspiration and direction. Uh, spiritual disciplines. And serving. We just talked about the fall festival. One of the ways you can train is go, yeah, I don't really feel like serving, but I'm going to do it because it's the right thing. And as you do it, you experience that blessing. And pre- how, how many times, have, raise your hand if you've ever not wanted to go to church? Out here. Oh, yeah, everybody's got their hands up. And then, how, and then think about it. You went and you were like, what was I thinking? This was so good for me. I needed to hear God's word today. I need Satan wants to pull you out of training. And Paul says, be aware of this and never quit training. Stay accountable. Keep moving on. Second thing Paul says is pursue 
God's purpose for you. He said, but I press on, this is really powerful, so that word press, exert, I'm pushing, I'm training, I press on to take hold, I, to grab hold of that thing for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Paul said, guess what? I'm pursuing Christ because for, for the reason he pursued me, he pursued me and he has a purpose for me. He called me on the Damascus Road, Paul said, and he has a purpose for me, and I want to lay hold of that purpose. It's been said that the two greatest days of a person's life are the day you're born and the day you know what you were born for. You're not on this earth by accident, and neither am I. Here's the second biblical principle I want to emphasize here. If you have a pulse, you have a purpose. Because <laughs> the second you don't have a purpose anymore, God will bring you home. So say that to the person next to you, please. If you have a pulse, you have a purpose, right? Oh, nice, nice. You are made to become like Jesus and to do good works which God created in advance for you. Ephesians 2.10, look it up at later. So you're not an accident. God put you and I here to be a one-of-a-kind gift to this world. You're unique. And God put you here at this time in the places he put us, in the families he put us, to make a difference for Christ and to bring God's goodness to the world. And you and I can only discover that purpose if we're pursuing Jesus. Because our purpose is in him. That's what you're constantly going to see in Scripture. In fact, one of the, Paul's favorite phrases is in Christ. Every good gift you have is in Christ. And by that he means as you're following and, and, and abiding in Jesus. If you aren't getting clear on your purpose, it may be that you've quit running the race. Queen Esther is a perfect example of this. Read the book of Esther. Long story short, Queen Esther is this beautiful young Jewish woman who lives in Persia. Persia is ruling the world at this time. And um, there's an evil plot against her people, the Jewish people. Um, she, but before that plot takes place, Esther is selected as queen. And nobody knows her identity. So she's the queen, uh, and the king of Persia is the most powerful person in the world. Long story short, there's a plot to kill the Jewish people. And Esther is tempted to keep her identity a secret because if she says who she is, or if she tries to intervene with her husband, very li it's very likely she'll be killed. And her uncle goes to her and says, challenges her not to abandon God because God's purpose for her may be in this very moment. And he says to her, who knows but that God has put you in, su in this position for such a time as this. We go, I don't want to be, why do I want to be here during COVID? Why do I want to be here when there's hard times? Just pay attention to scripture. The, the light shines the brightest in the darkness. And you and I, God put you as a light here in times of darkness and trouble and tribulation. Who knows that God put, hasn't put you here for such a time as this? Uptown Church is here for such a time as this. As our world searching and looking for what um, answers and truth and life. When she said yes to God, he used her to save her people, which were God's people. And maybe the same is true for you. God put you where he put you. And maybe you're tempted to run away from God's purpose rather than to run toward God's purpose. Just like Esther. And one of the things I would tell you about Esther is this. She didn't know which way things were going to go. But let me, this is, the, this is the key point about finding your purpose. You and I need to take the next step of obedience. Throughout Scripture, everybody is, is called to take that next step of obedience. And as they're obeying God's call on that, and that next step, purpose gets revealed. And so Esther didn't know she was going to be the savior of her people. She just knew, oh my gosh, I ha I'm safe, my people are dying, and I know God wants me to do something about it. And as she did that, she lived into her purpose. Same is true for you. So we got to keep training, and we got to keep pushing and find our purpose. Third thing is this, and we're going to uh, probably cut to the end after this, but narrow your focus. So what happens when you and I were training and we're pursuing our purpose, but what happens in this life? You have so many things coming at you, don't you? Uh, hey, join this club. Hey, do this thing. Hey, buy this thing. Hey, and one of the things Paul says is, as you're, you don't quit training, live into your purpose, 
And then he says, narrow your focus. Get clear on your priorities. Otherwise, you'll get distracted. He said this, but one thing I do. Have you got one thing? Have I got one thing? Do we know what our one thing is? This is a really important phrase in Scripture. It's, it's used multiple times. Um, so Jesus says to Mary and Martha, uh, Martha is frustrated with her sister and who's sitting at the feet of Jesus trying to listen to his teaching. And she goes to complain to Jesus and said, Martha, Mary has chosen the one thing, the better thing. And uh, the rich person comes to Jesus and says, hey, what must I do to be saved? And he said, one thing you lack. David is getting assailed by all kinds of enemies on every side in Psalm 27, 4. And you would think he'd say, oh God, the one thing I seek is freedom from my enemies or, or, or get these people to quit bugging me. And he says, but this is one thing I seek. I want to dwell in your house. I want to be in your presence, Lord. One thing. It's an important phrase in Scripture. And Paul says one thing because he's focusing. In fact, we're in Chicago, so hey, what's Michael Jordan famous for? I mean, don't give me any obscure answers. I go, Michael Jordan, what's he famous for? Anybody know? Basketball. What's he not famous for? Baseball, right. <laughs> you know, because Michael focused, and if you study his life, you know he focused, and that's winners become winners. Champions become champions because they know they're one thing. Charles Barkley is famous for what? Basketball again. Have you ever seen his golf swing? Look it up on YouTube. It is, like, unbelievably terrible. Like, you wouldn't, uh, you know, but do you know what your one thing is? One of the greatest problems in the world is we just have too many distractions. Uh, I want you to picture this. There was a college class, and the professor was a business professor. He's trying to teach his students time management and how to focus priorities. So he pulls out a mason jar, a gallon mason jar, and he takes these fist-sized rocks, five fist-sized rocks, and he puts them in the jar. And he says, is the jar full? And the, the rocks are up at the top. And everybody says, yes. And he says, Really? And then he pulls out pebbles like marbles, and he takes this jar, uh, pitcher of marbles and starts pouring them in. They start sorting in all around. And he goes, is the jar full? And they're catching on now, right? You know, and they go, no. And then he pulls a pitcher of sand, and he fills in the sand, and he packs that all in right to the top. He goes, is the jar full? He goes, no. And then he pulls a pitcher of water and is able to then pour that water in. And he said, um, and he said what, what's the point of this? exercise demonstration I've just showed you. One energetic student jumped up and he said, uh, if you work hard enough, you can pack more and more, as much stuff as you really want into your life. And the professor said, no, <laughs> that is not the point. The point is, if you didn't get the big rocks in the jar first, you would never get them in at all. It's about time management and priorities. Here's one activity I think every person on the planet should do every year. If you were to pick your five big rocks, you go, if, my, if I had to only have five priorities in my life, what would those five things be? Name your big rocks. In fact, online, if you have a big rock, you're thinking about what's one of the priorities you should have. And Paul says this. Paul says, I'll tell you what my big rocks are. I, I got one thing. I, I want to know Christ. I want to I I become like Christ. This is who I am. This is my one thing. I want to know Christ and be transformed in his image. And everything else is going to come second. Is that your one thing? Is that my one thing? Um, he, said that's my, he said the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And then he talks about forgetting what's behind. And some of us are held up because we have things behind us. And straining toward what is ahead. I'm going to jump down to the last point, which is this. Paul says this, and this is important for Uptown Church today on point five, which is this. All of us then, he said, the key is we have to not quit training. We need to pursue our purpose. We need to manage our priorities. We've got to narrow our focus and focus on the most important things, our one thing. And then the Last thing he says is we have to run the race with other runners. He goes from saying me, me, I, you, uh, so he's talking about himself in the singular to plural. So he says all of us then who are mature 
should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example. Paul says, us, us, together. Don't forsake the gathering of yourselves. God created us for community. And here's a simple principle. that Satan follows a simple rule. It's predator prey 101. Satan uses the same tactic. It keeps working over and over again. He tries to isolate someone from the pack, from the community, and then devour them. Satan is running around like a roaring lion. He wants to isolate you. If you're living a life of isolation, I want you to know something. You're, You're following the will of Satan, not the will of God. And I don't mean you're being safe with COVID. I'm talking about emotional, relational, spiritual isolation. God's economy says this, we are made for community, and when we run with other people, we all do better. Not just you, all of us do better. Runners do better with other runners. Guess why world records happen at major events? Because running with the fastest runners produces the best performance. It's why world records are constantly set in group settings. And we were made to encourage one another, so when we run with each other, We inspire one another. We encourage one another. We support one another. We train with one another. We hold one another accountable. You will always do better with other runners. So what's your one step as you run the race pursuing Christ? Because he has a step for you. And maybe for you, you've quit training. I noticed I put my notes up here, so I'm sorry there's so much text. I accidentally put some notes up here. And maybe for you, it's getting in a small group. Maybe it's joining the Sunday prayer thing, but you're like, I need to step into training that makes me uncomfortable because real training is about moving us from our comfort zone to a growth zone. Or maybe for you, your next step is a step of obedience. You are trying to pursue your purpose. You know God's been putting something on your heart. What's that thing God's been putting on your heart to do? Maybe it's to reach out to your neighbor. Maybe it's to do something at work, and you need to take that step of obedience. Maybe for you, like all of, all of us who live in this country with so many blessings, we're so distracted. Maybe it's to narrow your focus. And, and what does God want you to prioritize in this next season? And then how are you joining the community as you run and pursue Christ? I want you to know this. I'm cheering for you. I'm rooting for you. We're in this together. It's been a hard season. And at Uptown, it's been a hard season. But God has brought you through this in a mighty way. I want to close with this story, and then we're going to sing a song that's going to, um, going to I hope, uh, help you apprehend a truth you, you uh, maybe won't, aren't aware of in this process as you run the race. Um, one of the longest ultramarathons of all time was a race that went from Sydney, Australia to Melbourne, Australia. And in 1983, 150 world-class runners all went to Sydney to run this race. It was the longest race ever run. And these are the greatest athletes in the world. They're super fit. They've been training forever. And up walks this worn out 61-year-old potato farmer who's also a shepherd. And, and he's wearing overalls. He's missing a couple teeth. And he's got galoshes over work boots. And everybody's like, oh, go great. A local wants to watch the race. No, he wants to run the race. And, and, and they are like, you know, you know what this is? It's over 500 miles, 544 miles. He's like, I want a I bib. I want a ticket. I want to run the race. I want to um, uh, give me my number. So they give him his number. Everybody, poof, off goes the gun. They're all running. <laughs> He's soon in last place. He's, <laughs> yeah. And they're all laughing at him. Now, here's the backstory. His name's Cliff Young. He grew up on a 2,000-acre farm with 2,000 sheep. And, he, and so when a storm came, he did not have a, a four by four. He didn't have a forerunner. He didn't have a horse. He would run, and he would have to bring those sheep in from the 2,000 acres. It, it would take him two or three days sometimes to corral all the sheep. And so he spent his whole life actually training for this event. And he would do it in his rubber boots. In fact, there's a... There's a, 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 a a statue, and all it is is a rubber gum boot because he used to run in his rubber gum boots, right? And, uh, and so they all take off ahead of him, and there goes Cliff, and he's just shuffling along. Five days later, um, 
15 hours and four minutes, Cliff Young crosses the finish line in first place. 61 years old, true story. And you're like, oh my gosh, what happened? Tortoise in the hair, right? Yeah. Uh, and so was the, ne was the next closest guy minutes behind him? No. Our, he was 10 hours behind him. The next fastest runner was 10 hours behind him. Woo! <laughs> and I, I want to make a point here. We sometimes, it doesn't matter how you start. It doesn't matter how you look. You might have all the best gear. That's not what it's about. It's about this. It's about endurance. It's about perseverance. It's about God having his hand on your life. And regardless of how you look, God is going to help you finish this race. Look at what Hebrews says. It says, victory comes by endurance. Hebrews chapter 12. Let us lay aside every weight and sin that so easily entangles. And then what does it say? Let us run with endurance the race that God ha has marked out for you and for me. God has a race marked out for you. And you're going to win it if you're following Christ. That is God's promise. That is the promise of his word. So let's run together. And as we do that, we're going to hear this song and close in just a minute.